This is Kumamon, Kumamoto's beloved mascot. Cute, cuddly, friendly, he's worth a billion dollars to the local economy. And he's also quite hot, don't touch him on a sunny day. I must say I feel a sense of betrayal. I've travelled the length and breadth of Japan, visited numerous places that boldly proclaim to have the best view in the country, and yet all of those places seem pitifully insignificant when compared to this. The largest active volcano in Japan, and one of the largest volcanoes on the planet, Mount Aso. What does a billion dollar teddy bear a recently destroyed castle, raw horse meat sashimi, and a real life Smurf village all have in common. Well, they're all in one place, which we're gonna journey our way through today. Kumamoto lies on the west coast of the island of Kyushu. In 2016, it received global attention for all the wrong reasons, when a devastating magnitude seven earthquake struck the region killing 50 and injuring 3,000 people. Three years later, and whilst the city's recovered from the disaster, it's left its mark on historic structures such as Kumamoto Castle, which looks like it's been in a recent battle. But equally as worrying as the threat of the earthquakes is the spectre of Japan's largest volcano, the Aso Caldera, which lies just on the outskirts of the city. For those of you that play Zelda, this is essentially like being in Hyrule. Um, when you come to places like this, you see where Japanese games designers get their inspiration from. As beautiful as this place is, there is a sinister undertone to it all, especially when you look at the summit of Mount Nekor in the distance over there. The Aso Colnera covers a huge area with a circumference of 75 miles, and its geographically chaotic landscape consists of no less than five peaks. Classed as a supervolcano, fortunately, the last major eruption of the Aso Caldera took place 90,000 years ago. Though the last minor eruption took place in just May 2019, so the region is still very much active. One of the craters is a popular tourist spot, although it's often closed due to high levels of carbon and sulphur dioxide. So if you're planning a visit, be sure to check in advance, as nobody wants their holiday ruined by sulphur dioxide. But the geology of Kumamoto hasn't just shaped the landscape, it's actually influenced the way people live here in Smurf houses. Genuinely, I'm not, I'm not making it up either. I can't make up my mind what this looks like. Teletubby land, Smurf village, or bedrock uh, from the Flintstones, either way. It's quite the sight. 480 polystyrene domes stretched out before me. A village in its own right. It's off peak season, so there's nobody here at the moment. This is Asor Farm Village, and it's basically a resort town comprised of hundreds of domes. It came to national prominence in 2016 after the earthquake, the magnitude seven earthquake rocked the region because not a single dome here was damaged by the earthquake due to their sturdy polystyrene design. I actually remember reading about this place in a British newspaper. Uh, such, was its, uh, such was its reputation at the time. Who knows, maybe this is what the future of mankind will look like. Lots of, lots of domes. Um, it does look rather picturesque. <laughs> Smurfland, I mean Asso Farm Village, played an important role after the 2016 earthquake when over 4,000 buildings were destroyed and 600 people affected by the disaster took up shelter at the dome houses within the safety of the 20 centimetre thick polyurethane foam walls. Each dome house is seven metres in diameter with 40 square metres of space, ensuite bathrooms and thankfully air conditioning. The village even comes equipped with its very own cleverly branded smoking area. It's not quite tobacco, it's not quite a cottage, it is, you guessed it, Tapa Cottage, which has quickly become my new favourite word. All domes are created equal, but some domes are more equal than others. This is the royal, the royal section, the royal dome section. I love the, um, the effort and the detail that's gone into these places. Look at this, look at the, uh, the walls, real stone. Often, I know it sounds a bit weird, but often uh, walls in Japan that look like rocks are just plastic. But it's a real stone. This is so weird. I, uh, I would quite like to stay here actually, I think it'd be quite fun for one night or two. My only concern is the domes are very close together, so I don't know if you have much in the way of privacy, especially with the, uh, the thin walls. Other than that though, yeah, I think it'd be quite fun for one night. I finally found the one that I want, Royal 74, 
It has a very large, very nice, elaborate Japanese style garden. Uh, I say very large, it's, it's large by the standards of the gardens of Dome Village. Now to try and find my way out of this never ending dome nightmare. No sooner have I arrived in the city of Kumamoto, I find myself coming face to face with a slightly unnerving character who's quickly gone on to become Japan's most ubiquitous and wealthiest mascot. This is Kumamon, Kumamoto's beloved mascot. Cute, cuddly, friendly, often ranked as the most popular mascot in all Japan, he's worth a billion dollars to the local economy. And he's also quite hot, don't touch him on a sunny day. Wow. Kumamon everything. So apparently there's two reasons for Kumamon's success. Number one, he's rather cute, look at his little face. Although to me, I find him utterly terrifying. The second reason though is Kumamoto Prefecture is very smart with, uh, when it came to licensing Kumamon. Anyone can use Kumamon on their merchandise as long as it is promoting the Kumamoto region. So with that in mind, lots of companies sprang up across Japan exploiting his cuddly little face. And in recent years, it's brought in as much as $100 million a year in merchandise alone. Kumamon's widespread fame is without question. Look, here's Kumamon talking to a child on a bridge. Here he is talking to a famous French actress. But if, like me, you still find Kumamon's popularity to be something of an enigma, I interviewed a Japanese mascot expert to gain a greater understanding of the character's widespread appeal. Kumamon wa Kumamoto kara kimashita. Kumamon wa sugoi desu ne. Kumamon ga daisuki desu. Whatever you think about Kumamon, whether you love him or hate him, there's no denying he's a masterclass in the art of commercialization. Say Kumamoto to any Japanese person, there's always one dish that springs to mind. Raw horse meat, known as basashi. Now admittedly, I don't eat a lot of horses, given it's a little bit of a taboo dish in the UK, as it is in the US, even though it is widely eaten across Europe and Asia. Two years ago though, I made a video tasting a horse meat barbecue in North Japan, and as expected, it didn't go down too well with everyone. Nevertheless, it is the local dish of Kumamoto, and even if I didn't want to eat it, I have to do it, because it's YouTube, innit? It's time to eat the local dish of Kumamoto, the most famous dish by far, raw horse meat or if you want to be more elegant about it, sakura niku, cherry blossom meat, because it's pink like cherry blossom, but it's still raw horse meat. So most of the world, horse meat is uh, something we wouldn't dare to dream of eating. However, it's actually quite good. It tastes, quite, it's, it tastes good and it's good for you. It's high protein, low calories. Because the fat has a low melting point and it has kind of a sweet flavor to it, it tastes really nice raw. I don't eat it that often, but when I do eat it, I do enjoy it. Here we go. Mm. It's very really good. If you close your eyes and eat it, it tastes a bit like having tuna, which is my favourite fish. So it's not really a surprise that I enjoy it. We're really good. We have three different cuts of horse meat here. The only bit I'm not so keen on eating is this white stuff. This is the horse mane, like the, the neck of the horse. But it's, um, it's a little bit tough, a little bit hard and chewy. Interestingly, the consumption of horse meat isn't a particularly historic addition to the local culture. From the 6th century up until the 1860s, consumption of all four-legged animals within Japan was strictly prohibited in accordance with Buddhist practices. It was only in the 1960s when motorised vehicles meant horses were no longer needed for transport and agriculture that Kumamoto's overabundance of horse farmers presumably went, wait a minute, dinner time. And today, Kumamoto leads in the consumption of the delicacy across all of Japan, eating their way through 20% of the nation's annual 7,400 tonnes of horse meat. Obviously, when you eat it raw, it is cold. Um, so it does come with things like um, garlic, onions, hot foods that kind of spice it up a bit. If you barbecue it, it tastes a lot like beef, but in my view, it's better than beef. I had a, a horse barbecue with Riotro, I think, uh, last year, and it was some of the best meat I've ever had, honestly. A lot of viewers weren't very happy at the prospect of eating a horse, and I can understand that. I mean, when I first found out about this six years ago, I was horrified as well. But I've, I've grown to I've grown to love it. I don't eat it often. I eat it maybe three or four times a year at most. What's the verdict though? I would give it an eight out of ten. Highly recommend it. Kumamon would love it mm. if he was real. Wow, never seen anything like this. So this is Kumamoto Castle, one of the three main castles in Japan 
along with Himeji Castle and Matsumoto. We actually saw Himeji Castle a few weeks ago on this trip. Now, it looks like the castle's been in some kind of battle. The walls have collapsed and the tower's crumbling, um, but this is actually damage done by the 2016 Kumamoto earthquake. Regarded as one of the most impressive castles in Japan and stood in the centre of the city since the 1600s, Jesus, that's a lot of alliteration, visitors won't be able to go inside until 2021, when the reconstruction work is completed. That being said, I'd argue that witnessing the destruction has given the castle something of a unique edge. At first it may look a bit unpleasant because of the reconstruction work, but I think it's quite a powerful sight because usually Japanese castles have been renovated to perfection and they're kind of pristine in appearance, whereas this, there's something beautiful and organic about the walls being crumbled and caved in, the tower collapsing. There's a sense that this invincible, impenetrable structure really isn't so invincible after all. Because of the damage and the current repairs, you can't actually go in the castle, but to be honest, it's an architectural marvel best experienced from afar, best appreciated from the grounds. Like most castles in Japan, I don't really, between you and me, I don't really enjoy going in Japanese, uh, in the castle towers themselves. I find them, they've been renovated so much they've lost a lot of historical value. But for Kubamoto Castle, it's best enjoyed in the grounds. It's the perfect place to relax, unwind, and enjoy the incredible architecture. Well guys, what a splendid day it's been. We've seen the largest active volcano in Japan. We've uh, eaten a horse and we've been to Teletubby land. It's been a rather random, exciting day. I've really enjoyed my time in Kumamoto. On this journey across Japan, I've been listing off various places that I want to revisit and Kumamoto is definitely one of them. I feel like there's so much to do here. We've barely scraped the surface, but uh, hopefully from our time together, you've got a picture of what it's like here. Tomorrow, I'll be joined by my final guest, uh, who is a girl and a vlogger and she'll be joining me as we travel from Kumamoto to our final destination of Kagoshima. We're almost there, I can't believe it. It's mental, it's crazy. But anyway, no matter where you might be watching from, out there in the big wide world, guys, thanks for watching, thanks for being a part of Journey Across Japan, and I'll see you right back here to do it again tomorrow. Kumamo wa Kumamoto kara kimashita. Kumamo wa sugoi desu ne. Kumamo ga daisuki desu.